Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. Taking another break from France for a short cast in a particular wine fault that actually might be the most common one of them all, cork taint or TCA. Though there are a lot of wine faults out there, and while they each don't merit their own cast, this one certainly does, and several others do as well. So be on the lookout in the future for more casts on Trouble in the Bottle, but for now, let's get started by taking a look at bottles that are corked. Though you'll sometimes hear the term corked used as a generic term for a flawed bottle of wine, regardless of the flaw, strictly speaking, the term is reserved for bottles that are contaminated with one of several compounds, the most common being TCA, or 246-trichloroanisol, and to a lesser extent TBA, 246-tribromoanisol. Contamination from these compounds results in wines that show a specific suite of unpleasant odors and flavors, usually described as dank or musty, and that have a diminished vibrancy of fruit and other characteristics in their flavor and aroma profiles. TCA and TBA are byproducts that are created when fungi interact with chlorinated or brominated phenols, compounds that are found on wood products, including natural corks, which are made from the bark of a tree. These phenols are toxic to fungi, but resistant fungi have developed ways to convert them from phenols into anisols, which are not toxic to the fungi, or to you and me for that matter. The basic process involved is called methylation, which involves swapping out a hydrogen atom in the phenol for a carbon and three hydrogen atoms called a methyl group, with the final result being either TCA or TBA or one of the other more rare compounds that are produced in roughly the same way and have roughly similar effects on the wine. So where do these phenols, the precursors for TCA and TBA, come from? Well, the most common place to find them seems to be on or in natural cork. Hence the terms corked and cork taint to describe this flaw. Cork is made from porous tissue in the bark of a particular oak tree, Quercus suber, and has nooks and crannies where these compounds can hang out and where they can come in contact with airborne fungi that will interact with them and produce the compounds that will result in this flaw. But how did the phenols get on the cork in the first place? That's less clear. It used to be thought that chlorinated phenols were left over on the cork from the process used to bleach and sanitize corks that involved dipping them in chlorine-based solutions. But in recent years, chlorine has been phased out of this process, but TCA hasn't disappeared. It's possible that chlorinated phenols may just come part and parcel with the oak bark that corks are made from. The origins of brominated phenols, the ones that produce TBA, also aren't completely clear, but brominated phenols were used as fungicides and pesticides, and that might explain their presence in cork bark. Whatever the case may be, though, when a particular cork is contaminated with enough TCA or TBA to pass the human threshold of perception, and that cork comes in contact with wine, it'll pass the TCA or TBA to the wine, and the result will be a corked bottle. The part about perception is important. Though most people can perceive a concentration of either of these compounds at as little as four to six parts per trillion in solution, there are contaminated corks that won't yield that level of concentration, and wine with so little TCA or TBA may not be perceived as tainted or flawed at all. So you might have a case of wine with 12 otherwise identical bottles, but one of them will be perceived as cork, while the others won't. I like to call this phenomenon stochastic or random TCA-TBA, and when you find a situation like this, which seems to be the most common situation involving corked wines out there, you can be pretty confident that corks are the source of the contaminant, because they're the only variable in terms of what the wine has contact with. But there's also another scenario that can play out too, usually just involving TCA. Chlorinated phenols can form in a winery when a chlorine-based cleaner, like bleach say, meets wood or wood products like cardboard and paper. These phenols can come in contact with airborne fungi that produce TCA, and TCA will be present in the winery and not just the corks. Since some of the wood that this TCA can form on could be things like barrels and wooden fermentation vats, the potential is there to contaminate entire batches of wine and not just individual bottles. Also, rubber attracts TCA and items in the winery made from rubber, like the hoses that move the wine from tank to tank or tank to barrel, can become spots where TCA concentrates and then has contact with whole batches of wine.
Though rare, especially since awareness of the role of chlorine-based cleaners has gone up among winemakers, wineries do become contaminated in this way, and knowing this helps explain why wines sealed with non-cork closures, like screw caps, can also suffer from cork taint. Needless to say, if a winery does become contaminated this way, that is, systemically as opposed to stochastically, that's really bad because the effort needed to get rid of TCA in the winery will be much bigger and much more expensive than just buying a new batch of corks. So what's a corked wine actually smell and taste like? Well, like I said earlier, TCA or TBA aren't always detectable, but if they do pass the smell detection threshold, there are two broad clues that'll tip you off to their presence. The first is what you smell, and the second is what you don't smell. First, Look for a more or less pronounced, depending on concentration, odor that most people describe as wet cardboard or newspaper. That's a great descriptor for this flaw because if you've ever smelled a wet batch of cardboard or a damp stack of newspapers, you've probably smelled TCA. Newsprint and cardboard are wood products after all, and the same thing is going on with them that's going on in cork. You'll also hear descriptors like musty or moldy basement, rainy vacant lot. You get the idea. And those are good too. One that you'll hear a lot is wet dog, and I have to tell you, we've been dog-sitting a couple of dogs for years now, this adorable little guy and his now-departed brother, God rest him, best of schnauzers, and we live in Seattle, go Hawks, that despite this lovely picture, gets pretty rainy, and never once, not even a little bit, have I thought either of the dogs smelled like cork taint. So go fig and let me know in the comments if you disagree. Second, you will notice that the fruit and other aromas that you'd expect to be in the wine will be missing or at least noticeably muted. In fact, sometimes your only clue that the bottle is corked will be that the wine just smells and tastes severely diminished when it comes to fruit, and the dank, musty smells won't be noticeable at all. In fact, even if the TCA TBA is noticeable, your nose will acclimate to it pretty quickly and the perception of the off odors will diminish over time. This is different from many other wine faults where off odors remain consistently perceptible, and this makes it especially important to trust your first impressions of the wine and get a second opinion from someone else if you suspect that the wine you're drinking may be corked. How often are you likely to run into a corked bottle? That's hard to say as it's hard to get reliable data since most of the bottles of wine in the world are opened and sampled in private settings and on occasions where the last thing on a wine drinker's mind is carefully recording the fact that the wine they were so excited about was flawed. The best data come from events like wine-related conferences and symposia where lots of bottles are uncorked at once, or from wine review magazines and journals that open lots and lots of bottles over the course of doing reviews. These data suggest that somewhere between 2 and 7% of all bottles have noticeable levels of TCA, and most sources seem to agree that 5% is a good number to settle on if you're splitting the difference. That may not seem like much, but since it's equivalent to 1 in 20, try thinking of it this way. If you buy 12 bottles or a case of wine, that means that there's about a 50% chance that one of the bottles in that case is corked. As someone who opens a fair number of bottles over the course of the year, I know I always get just a little feeling of dread when I'm pulling the cork on a bottle, especially if it's a nice, old, rare, or otherwise hard to replace bottle, and that feeling doesn't go away until I give the wine a sniff and a sip. Thankfully, the incidence of corked bottles seems to be going down, and this decrease is linked to better practices involving cork processing and winery sanitation. But, the more research needs to be done, what evidence there is seems to suggest that TCA may not be separable from the use of corks. Corked bottles that are sealed with non-cork closures, like screw caps and artificial cork, are much rarer than those involving natural cork, but remember, if you ever do find a corked bottle with a non-cork closure, that suggests that the problem is systemic within the winery, and it's possible that the entire batch of wine that the bottle was filled from is corked. Since I like to end casts with practical advice, let's end this one by tackling some very non-theoretical questions related to corked wines. First, will drinking a corked wine hurt you? Nope, not even a little bit. TCA is harmless, but it is unpleasant to drink or smell, especially if the taint is severe, and I've never met anyone who gladly finished a glass of corked wine, let alone a bottle. Second, is there anything you can do about a corked wine? Other than being stoic about it, not really. 
From time to time, you'll hear someone claim that there's a remedy involving dropping wadded up plastic wrap into a decanter with the tainted wine, and there is something to that. What experiments have been done have shown that there can be some reduction in the TCA, TBA aromas because these compounds are attracted to the polyethylene the wrap is made from. But no one thinks that plastic wrap gets you anywhere close to what the bottle should taste like, and the fruit and other aromas will remain compromised. You absolutely should take back the bottle that was corked to where you bought it, and you should do that with complete confidence that the retailer will replace the bottle and that the winemaker will be delighted that that's what you did, because no wine producer wants anyone's impression of their wine to be based on a flawed bottle. All of this assumes, of course, that the place where you bought it is still around and you still have proof that you bought it there, so hold on to your receipts. But this can become impractical if you've been sitting on the bottle for a while or it's a rare, very old bottle that can't easily be replaced. And in those cases, you may end up having to eat the cost of the bottle or settle for a replacement that isn't as old or precisely the same thing as the cork bottle was. So you should see cultivating a philosophical attitude again. Thanks again for joining me for another Winecast. As always, I hope it was informative and enjoyable and left you knowing something that you didn't know before. If it did meet these criteria, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and thanks to everyone who has or who's just taken the time to give any of these casts a look. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.